Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Seeds and Weeds podcast, brought to you by Small House Farm. If you're looking to celebrate plants and the people that love them, then this is the podcast for you. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen. Howdy, friends. Welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to be sitting down for five questions with the one and only Greg Peterson. Now, you probably know Greg is the host of the Urban Farm Podcast. We're going to be talking about a show, the importance of seed banks, how to grow elderberries, and so many other things. It was a really fun interview. But before we get into that, the first thing I want to do is give a shout out to Amy L. Now, Amy just recently joined our Patreon, so she's going to get a free digital copy of my book from our Seeds and Their Keepers. She gets exclusive access to content and coupon codes. Plus, we're going to be sending Amy a seed gift basket full of herbal goodness. Now dig it. The summer solstice baskets that we're sending out, it's got a nice tea blend in there. It's made with lemon balm and globe amaranth and rose hips. Oh man, it's nice as a hot tea, but it is a really good iced tea. Exactly what we're going to need this summer. The basket also has a nice sample of spruce tips that we just harvested from the trees down the way, plus some other small house products. Our famous shoe bug spray and herbal after sun spray and some of our handcrafted plantain sap. It is quite a bundle of goodies. We send a basket like this out to our Patreon subscribers every Every season. So if you haven't signed up yet, you might want to consider it. Plus, by joining the Patreon, you're helping to keep the podcast on the air. So if you like the show, it is a great way to show your support. I'll drop that link down in the show notes for you, but you can also find it on our website, seedsandweedspodcast.com. So anyway, thank you again to Amy and to all the rest of you that have signed up. We really appreciate you. Now that the weather's finally warmed up around here, we've been busy getting everything planted. It hasn't rained in days, maybe weeks. It's getting pretty dry around here, so it's definitely been a challenge getting all the plants in and keeping them happy. But, you know, just a couple years ago in June, we were experiencing massive flooding, so it seems like it's nothing but extremes around here. I guess you just gotta learn how to roll with it, right? Do what you can and try not to be too hard on yourself if things don't work out. We just started getting our beans planted, and every year we try to grow some cool new varieties. Um, I posted in our Seeds and Weeds Facebook group asking folks about their favorite beans to grow, and just like I expected, what happened. Everyone's got their own favorite. There were so many different answers. Uh, some folks, they're diehard pole bean fans. Others, they only grow bush beans. I think everybody had a different variety that they swear by. Uh, it's kind of fun though. You know, there's hundreds of different beans to grow. So I kind of want to try them all. We're growing some classics this year. Beans that we grow almost every summer, like uh, Grandma Roberts Purple Pole, the Grape Fall Bean. We're growing Kermit Smoky Mountain Bean, Angelo and Piero, the Anakin Cavilli Giant. We're also growing this cool Italian bush bean. The bean pods are actually curved. They curve into a small circle. They're called Annalino de Trento, which means Little Ring of Trento. Now, Trento is the town in northern Italy where the beans are from, and the Little Ring describes the shape of the bean pods. I'm pretty excited about those. Um, I've been trying to focus on growing more varieties from Italy in our garden this year. If all goes well, we'll have lots of seeds on our website for everybody's gardens next year. You can always check out our seed collection. We have an online seed store. You can find it at smallhousefarm.com slash seeds. And I'll go ahead and put that link down in the show notes, too, if you're interested. All right, let's get on to the interview. Greg Peterson is the creator and chief visionary of The Urban Farm, and in 2015, he launched The Urban Farm Podcast. In Phoenix, Arizona, Greg created one of the first environmental showcases for urban farming on a quarter-acre plot that featured more than 80 fruit trees. Greg's passion is providing people with the tools and information that they need to grow their own food. And today, Greg's joining us on the podcast to answer five questions. Mr. Greg Peterson, welcome to the Seeds and Weeds Podcast. We are so excited to have you here. Oh my gosh. Thanks for having me. I love doing this. Now, before we jump into the interview, can you just tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and the work that you do? Sure. So it actually, for me, goes back to when I was 13, 14 in the fourth grade. I wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the oceans. This was 1975. So I I, I, I often tell people, I don't know where it came from. I think I was born with this notion that we need to be a lot more conscious around our food. And in 1981, I was on the board of Arizona Aquaculture Association, uh, fish farms in Arizona. There are some. And we visited a farm. And one of the things that I noticed is they were growing the fish, harvesting the fish, throwing everything else that wasn't away, that wasn't edible. They were throwing it away, which is like 70 percent of the fish. And it just didn't make sense to me. So. Back in 1981, 82, I developed what would now be called a regenerative fish farm. This is a, and I have all the paperwork that from back then, it, it's just graphics that I wrote on a paper where everything got used. So we were growing fish and we were growing grains and we were growing different things so that the only thing that got produced that left the farm 
was something that was usable, be it, be it fertilizer or food or anything like that. Then fast forward to 1991, I discovered permaculture. Fast forward to 2001, and I was in a class at Arizona State University getting my undergraduate degree, and I was to create a mission and vision for my life. And I had purchased in 1989, a third of an acre right in the middle of Phoenix. Then in 2001, in this mission and vision statement that I was really doing what I wanted, I had created a, what we now call an old growth food forest on that third of an acre in Phoenix, where there's always just like a forest, there's always something to eat. So then in 2002, I started doing tours and uh, started my podcast in 2015. And we're over 750 episodes on that. And here we are today. That's incredible, man. So you've really been doing this your entire life. Yeah, this is my life's work. That's that's wild. So now you've been you were in Phoenix for a long time and you said you had a third of an acre there and this thing was just packed full of plants, right? You had 80 fruit trees, you had rainwater catchment system, you had the whole nine yards going on there. Yep chickens. And the cool thing was, is that I planted open pollinated seeds and let them go to seed every year. So every, you know, every season I would have carrots and broccoli and basil and parsley and nasturtiums and cowpeas and sweet potatoes. And it just, the list goes on and on of stuff that would just grow every year. And all I had to do was harvest. That's awesome. So now you recently just moved to a new place in Asheville, North Carolina last year. And what do you got? Four acres there? I do have have four acres and we're just getting prepped. I was meeting with some people today. I have 200 fruit trees and elderberry plants to get planted in the next two weeks. So that's a project. Yeah, busy times. So what was the very first thing you planted or plan to plant here in the new property? Well, so a friend of mine, Zach Brooks from Arizona Worm Farm, after I had a miserable failure on my garden last year, said, Greg, remember, your first garden is probably going to be your worst garden. And it mostly had to do with soil. When we arrived here a year ago, you know, I immediately started putting things in the ground and the soil just wasn't prepped well enough. So we had tomatoes and peppers and, you know, uh, melons and that kind of stuff. And uh, they did OK, but really didn't do well. And and a lot of it has to do with prepping your soil. Now you said miserable failure and you also said that you've been doing this your whole life and I think that's an interesting point for our listeners. Somebody yes. that has been involved in this for as long as you have still struggles and has failure sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, on my podcast, that's one of my questions. I ask people share with me about a failure and what they learn from it, because that's how we learn. If we're always successful, we're not always learning. It's those mistakes that we make where we didn't, you know, completely follow through on something or something didn't work. That's where we learn. And we take that and don't, you know, don't make that mistake again and just build your garden from there. I dig it, man. And, you know, you launched that Urban Farm podcast. That was what, about eight years ago? Is that what you said? Yeah, seven and a half years ago, 2015. Okay, cool. And you've had, I mean, I love your show. You've had all these groovy plant people on there. You got gardeners, permaculturists. There's so much cool stuff happening there. But one of my favorite shows that you do is the Seed Chats with Bill McDormand. Yes. I love Bill. He's such a groovy cat for sure. Tell us more about the Seed Chats, what that type of episode is all about, and maybe a little bit about how you got hooked up with Bill. Oh, well, Bill and I go back. 20 years. I don't even remember. I, I guess I really got to know Bill when I signed up for their in-person week-long seed school in Tucson. So I actually traveled from Phoenix to Tucson and spent a week in Tucson learning about seeds, seed starting and that kind of stuff. And we just connected. And both of us have this vision of creating a space where everybody that gardens has a stockpile or seed bank of seeds. We have a really big problem problem with our food system. We have a three day supply of food in any urban area, in any grocery store. And I say it's more like three hours. We saw that happen, you know, in the pandemic and with storms, the grocery store shelves just empty. Same thing is true for seeds. And if you don't have seeds locally, you can't grow food. And so one of the things that Bill and I have talked a lot about, and we created a business called the Great American Seed Up, we have put systems in place for people to be able to super energize their local communities with seeds. It really puts us in a situation where we have a seed bank, hopefully in everybody's freezer. And 
That's Bill and I are on the same page about that. And about five years ago, we started offering our monthly free seed chats. We do them live, but you can find out about them at seedchat.org. Man, I love that. One thing I always say when I'm talking to folks about seeds is that local food is only as local as the seed that it grows from. Amen to that. So how do you feel about seed libraries? Oh, any way that we can vitalize our local seed economy, I'm for it. And seed libraries have exploded in the past 10 years, and I'm just loving it. Um, you know, and I, I appreciate the seed bank and the importance, like you said, of having the seeds in the freezer like that. So we all have a ready supply of locally adapted seeds. But there's something about the seed library to me, how it serves as a hub for the community where it's, you know, it's always in motion. I think it's just such a such a cool idea. Oh, big time. So today we're going to do five questions. Um, now, there's going to be no follow up questions. That's the plan. Um, although I've broken that rule a number of times already, but the idea uh-huh. here is just five questions. Um, and that's going to be it. Are you ready for that? Let's do it, man. All right. Number one, if you had to pick a favorite plant or plant family, what would it be and why? Fruit trees and peaches, because you plant them once and you get fruit for decades and maybe even hundreds of years. I had a citrus tree, two citrus trees growing in the backyard of the urban farm that were planted in the 1920s. And when I left last year, they were still thriving. That makes them over either just out or over 100 years old. That's amazing. That's super cool. And I'm going to break my rule right here already and ask a follow up question. You specifically said peaches. Why is that? Oh, <sighs> The moment you harvest a peach off of a tree, if it's ripe, if you take a bite into it, it is, in my opinion, the single best fruit on the planet when it's ripe and coming off of the tree. And you have to grow them yourself because once you do, you're so spoiled, you can't buy grocery store ones anymore. This grocery store ones, they're awful compared to the ones in your yard. So, they're, you know, when when you're picking it ripe right off of the tree, it's the nectar of the gods. Oh, I can dig that, man. I feel the same way about homegrown tomatoes, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Next question, Greg. What is your most recent garden success? Oh, my gosh. So on my podcast, I interviewed Samara Price about six months ago. She is a local purveyor of elderberry products. And she said to me on her podcast that she was having trouble sourcing elderberries. I said, well, I can grow elderberries. I've never grown elderberries. I don't even know what they look like. But I said to her, I can grow elderberries. So I started digging into it and I found that they grow pretty prolifically from sticks. So you take a cutting and you stick them in the ground and they grow. So I purchased 100 elderberry sticks, two different varieties, and I put them in four by four by nine pots with some azomite mycorrhiza, a little bit of fertilizer and some nice potting mix. And that was two months ago. And in the four by four by nine pots, the plants are dang near root bound. I'm getting them ready to put in the ground here in the next two weeks. All right. For the next question, I'm going to take a move right out of your playbook. What is a recent garden failure that you've had? Or more specifically, what's the lesson that you can learn from it? Uh, Thank you for that. Bless you. I love that. You know, I'm not going recent. I'm going to go far back. And this is the history behind my question. In 2004, I started a business. I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had over 30 businesses. Uh, some of them lasted overnight. Some of them, I have two of them that are well over 20 years old each. And I started a urban farm nursery in Phoenix, Arizona, and we were going to raise organic veggie starts in four inch organic pots. Okay. And I jumped in full on. And rather than doing 8,000 starts, we did 80,000 starts our first year. Oh, wow. (laughs) Right. And, you know, we we were set for success. Quite honestly, we were really, I had a method to sell that many plant starts in the Phoenix metropolitan area. I was on it. I was the marketing guy. I was on it. And the plants looked beautiful in January. And so this would have been January of 2004. And the weather was extraordinary. February rolls around and it rained every week. Uh Oh, and it helped the plants. But when it's raining in Phoenix, Arizona, people don't go out. My basically my market evaporated and I ended up with, I don't know, 50,000 plant starts and they were on the roof of my house and then backyard on pallets. And, you know, we were just doing all that we could to market them. So by the time uh, March 15th rolls around they're they're getting, you know, they need to get out of the pot. So I actually, what I did is I put them out to my entire email list and I said, we're giving these away. Really? For a donation. We asked for donations. I said, come on and pick them up. And people just showed up and hauled them away and 
And so that was the failure part. The what I learned was twofold. I didn't observe enough and I should have really started at a at a level that was more like eight or 10,000 rather than 80,000. But the second thing I, I learned, and this is really the big value for me, I didn't want to be in that business. That wasn't a business that I really wanted. You know, when we were done with that season, it's like, man, this sucks. I'm not interested. I don't want to do this. So that was really my big learning. It's like, okay, now as an entrepreneur, that's a really good thing to know because, okay, that's another thing I don't want to do. Right. My mistake was I went too big in the first place. My learning was, okay, I don't want to do that. I dig it. All right. So here's the next question. What is the current project that you're working on that you're very excited about that you want to share with us today? Well, definitely the elderberries. You know, they're in their four by four by nine pots. They're growing. The Bob Gordon ones are in full flower in the four by four by nine pots from sticks two months ago. And I am moving forward with planting them out. We're going to, I have pasture on the property here. So we're bringing in a sod cutter and a sod cutter basically takes the top two and a half inches of sod and cuts it right off and leaves me a two and a half foot wide, two and a half inch deep trench. And we're going to take the sod and we're going to put it on the downhill side of the hill. So it, it'll create a little berm. We're going to rent an auger and drill the holes for the trees. I have stone fruit and the elderberries. When I plant the elderberries, I'm going to plant them with mycorrhiza, two ounces of mycorrhiza, a pound of azimuth, a pound of fertilizer and some potassium because we're low on potassium here. I had some soil tests done. Uh, once the tree, trees and elders are planted, then I'm going to put cardboard in the trenches. I'm going to lay a, a half inch poly tube in the trench. I'm going to add irrigation coming off the poly tube and I'm going to cover it with three inches of woody mulch. And that's how I'm going to keep the weeds down and let them get established the first year. I'm working on organic certification with my buddy, Scott Murray. He's coaching me through that through CCOF so that by two years from now, when we're harvesting elderberries, I can be selling organic elderberries. Man, that's very cool. And I really appreciate you explaining all the details like that for our listeners so they can really see all that goes into making a project like that work. All right, here's the the last question for you. What is a project that you are not personally involved in, but you're still really excited about it? So who's your shout out today? Oh my gosh. You know what? About three months ago, I get this email from a gentleman named Enoch Graham and he's at let's get growing live. And he does a weekly YouTube show on Saturday afternoons about gardening. And he invited me to be on the show and we chatted and I watched it several times since. In fact, I think you've been on a show too. That's right. I have. Yeah, he is. I just love the work that he's doing. He's uh, Let's Get Growing on YouTube and Let's Get Growing dot live is his website. He's rocking it. He is rocking it. I love Enoch. He was actually on the podcast as well a few episodes back. Oh, nice. Yeah, super cool guy. So I'm going to put the link for everybody to the YouTube um, down in the show notes for this show as well so they can follow up with that. And I'll probably put a link to that episode. For those of you that haven't heard that one yet, you can tune in because that was a really good one. And that's five questions, buddy. And that's all the time that we have today. So what are your links so folks can find you online? Urbanfarmpodcast.com. Perfect. Sounds great, man. I'm going to put, as always, I'm going to put all those links down in the show notes. Greg, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us today, man. That was super fun. I loved it. Thank you for having me. And there you have it, my friends. We have come to the end of another show. Big thanks to Greg Peterson for answering our five questions. This episode was edited and produced by all of us here at Small House Farm. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can always subscribe to our Patreon. That link and many more can be found at seedsandweedspodcast.com. The music you're listening to right now is a little soft rock guitar by Julius H. I'm Bevan Cohen, and we'll see you next time. Howdy friends, Bevan here. I just wanted to let you know that the Seeds and Weeds podcast is made possible in part by Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company. Rareseeds.com is America's top source for rare and heirloom varieties from around the world. Join us this September 12th through 14th at the Ventura County Fairgrounds in Ventura, California for the National Heirloom Expo. It's been called the World's Fair of Pure Food, and when you go, you'll see why. Find out more at the heirloomexpo.com.